students, or I shouldn't say students, his disciples, his followers. Uh, Plato kind of takes this to a deeper level. What does his faith really consist of uh, that Socrates had? Well, the Phaedo is largely a dialogue about the immortality of the soul. They want to know, Socrates, why are you so serene and confident as you face the death? And Socrates says to them, don't you realize that philosophy itself is a preparation for death? I've always been prepared for death. And uh, if you're philosophers, you're doing the same thing. But they're troubled because they're not sure that the soul really survives death at all. So he gives some arguments, and I won't go through all of them, but the gist of it, at least in the earlier half of the dialogue, is to show that there are things he calls the forms that are intelligible realities in terms of which we understand this sensible world. Uh, the form of the equal itself, or the form of sameness, or form of difference, uh, form of unity, and so forth. And that these forms must exist because we have these concepts, such as same or different, or one, uh, or not one, that we don't gather just from sense experience. I mean, and here's an example I've used over and over already in our class, but I'll just repeat it briefly. Is this one? Well, it is one, of course, but it's also not one, right? It's many parts. And the same would be true of any physical object that we encounter. Any physical object is one, but also not one, because if it's a physical thing, it has parts. And so everything we encounter is both one and not one. So how could we get that concept of one out of our sense experience? Everything is both that and not that. So how is it that I get that concept then? And uh, Socrates says we don't from our sense experience. We have it from our prior knowledge of the forms that is born within us. And so there are these intelligible realities he calls the forms. And then he says, so the question about the soul is, is it more like the intelligible realities that are eternal and unchanging, or more like the, the sensible realities, such as the body, that are temporary and pass away? And he says, well, the soul knows the forms. The soul has an innate affinity to the forms. And so the soul seems to be more like the forms, more like the intelligible reality, which is what it knows. And on that basis, he says, this is a kind of a provisional conclusion. It seems that then the soul, being more like that intelligible reality, <coughs> must survive death. Uh, and that's, that's a powerful argument as far as it goes. But it's not a conclusive argument. And his uh, disciples who were there, two of them in particular, uh, say, well, you may be right, Socrates, but here's what troubles me. And they raise two objections. Uh, one of them, named Simeus, raises the objection um, that couldn't the soul, even if it is something intelligible and immaterial, couldn't it be like the harmony of the parts? And he gives the analogy of, of a lyre being tuned um, to be in harmony. Okay, and the harmony isn't itself another physical thing added to the lyre. It's just the way that the strings are pulled into tension. Could the soul be like that? It's just the harmony present within our body that enables us to live and to act. And just like when the lyre is destroyed, the harmony is destroyed with it. On this analogy, when the body is destroyed, the soul will be destroyed with it. In other words, he's saying to Socrates, maybe you're right, the soul is something immaterial, but that doesn't prove that it survives death. Okay. That's a major challenge. Then there's another disciple there named Cebes, who offers an even uh, more difficult challenge. He says, well, I'm willing to grant maybe the soul does survive death, but here's the way I think of it. Maybe the soul is like uh, a weaver who makes a cloak for himself, and he wears the cloak. And the cloak is like the body. And eventually the cloak wears out, so he throws it away, and he makes another. And then he wears that cloak. 
and it grows in inches. And he throws it away, he makes another one. And he made through the course of his life, he may wear a dozen different clothes. So the soul may exist for a long time and survive through many different bodies. But who's to say that maybe eventually the soul itself doesn't die too? Just like the weaver eventually will die. The weaver's not immortal. He lives longer than his folks do, yes, but that's not the same as being immortal. So who's to say the soul may not survive this death only to perish later, perhaps? Perhaps a dozen, a dozen further deaths down the road. And that's also a very hard challenge, because C.B. is saying, even if you show that the soul survives death, that doesn't prove that it's truly immortal. Now, it's very interesting to see the difference in the way Socrates handles these two objections. The first one, the simious objection, that the soul might be like a harmony. He says, I have an argument why that can't be the case. And here's my argument. That the harmony is the state present within the thing. It's not what acts to make the thing do what it does. In your analogy of a liar, you need a musician to make it make music. Well, the soul can't be just a harmony because the soul is what acts. The soul is what makes me move. The soul is that by which I perceive and think. So the soul is, an, is not just a state, it's an active agent. And no harmony is an active agent. And he has further arguments. Uh, I won't go through all of them, he actually has several. But he tries to show that that proposal is simply mistaken. In other words, he tries to use reason to refute a rational objection. For Cedes, the second objection, the weaver analogy, he doesn't do that, at least not right away. Um, and in fact, um, what happens at that point is the other disciples who are present, uh, Phaedo in particular, the man who's retelling this exchange, um, when he, he's sort of the narrator, and he says, you know, we who were listening at this point felt like the rug had been pulled out from under our feet because we had been totally on board with what Socrates was arguing earlier. And then these two objections come along, and we didn't know what to think. And we felt almost like we'd been betrayed because we had trusted the logos, the argument, up to that point. And then it let us down because there were these arguments that we didn't know how to answer. And uh, Phaedo then says something like that to Socrates. And Socrates says, Phaedo, there's a name for what this is. You're suffering from a kind of illness. <laughs> uh, it's called mythology. The hatred of reason. Uh, you know the term uh, a misanthrope? In fact, this I think is the analogy he uses. A misanthrope is someone who trusted people. He liked people. And they let him down. And now he just hates people. Can't stand anybody. Hates the human race. Well, mythology is the state of having trusted reason, and you realize it's let me down. And I can't trust it anymore. And so there's a kind of a hatred of reason. Uh, and Socrates says, you know, I can refute an argument, but this is a state of the soul. And so uh, what he does then is to um, sort of work around the question. Um, he develops more about the forms. Um, in fact, uh, let me see if I can pull out something. Well, he does rebut the harmony theory, as I mentioned. Oh, yeah. Well, then what he does is to describe his own sort of intellectual life and how his own early studies had uh, led him to some truth, reading Anaxagoras. We've talked about this in our class. So I won't go into all the details. But how um, he realizes that right now, even as he's speaking with his disciples, he can't give a final answer. He can't prove conclusively that there are such things as forms. And uh, in light of that, he ultimately doesn't succeed in proving conclusively that CVs is wrong. 
and that the soul isn't like the weak. He kind of leaves that possibility hanging. But what he does do is to tell a story at the end. A story of uh, if the soul does survive death, what will it like be encountered? And this goes back, I think, to the, to the element of faith that's present throughout his life. Uh, he has a faith that reason isn't given to us for no reason. That the gods have given it to us in order to live by it. And therefore, because the gods are good, if we live by reason and seek truth, the gods will honor him. And that faith is evident in everything he does. And so the story that he tells from the end of the Phaedo is of a divine judgment in the eye. And how the soul, when it does leave the body, has to stand before the judgment seat of the gods and be judged according to whether it has sought truth and lived according to the truth. And he tells that story and he says at the end, you know, I don't know that this story is true. But I think that this or something like it is what it befits a noble man to believe. And then he says, I'm ready to drink the honey. And there's a little interesting note about that final passage uh, or episode. Um, uh, before he drinks the hemlock, or, or I think after, just after he drinks it. But he sits down uh, and he says to Crichton these famous words, these are his last words. Crito was one of his disciples. He says, Crito, we owe a cop to Asclepius. Now you know that Asclepius was the god of healing. And a cop was the normal sacrifice to make in gratitude for having been healed. So he is indicating that somehow they have been healed of something. And he doesn't say, I owe a cop to Asclepius. Some people read this and think he's saying that I'm about to be healed of being in this body, of being in this life. Um, uh, but he doesn't say, I owe a copy of Asclepius. He says, we. We collectively owe a copy of Asclepius. And the only reference to healing in the whole dialogue is to their need to be healed of, of disease or sickness of the soul. So if you read between the lines, what he's saying is, um, you now know what you now know enough to realize that reason can be trusted. And it does. Now, <laughs> whatever else you make of that, it's an incredibly powerful human example of someone who puts his faith in reason. And think of what that means. We th often think of those two as if they're opposed to each other, as if reason is a rival of faith, as if reason can undermine it. For Socrates, reason depends on faith. Because he's seeing that these are the questions reason can't answer. There's no way you can prove there is such a thing as truth. There's no way you can prove that we're capable of knowing the truth. And there's no way you can prove that if we are capable of knowing it, we have a kind of a moral imperative to live according to them. These are all matters of faith. And that's what Nietzsche saw as well. And that's what Nietzsche couldn't accept. He couldn't have that faith. But Plato did. Now, the, the final thought I want to leave with you. Um, let me see how we're doing our time. Uh, yeah, this will be the final one. Is um, that's Plato. Uh, Plato can take us so far. But Plato still leaves us with, if you will, faith that trusts in something yet to, be, yet to come, yet to be found. And for Socrates, it's that judgment awaiting after death. Um, uh, when you turn to scripture and to Christian teaching, what you find is that uh, the truth is not only something to be known, sought, Intellectual. Christ says, I am the truth. And the truth speaks to us and invites us to know him as a person through obedience to his commandments. Now, this is something Plato didn't envision. But I think if he had envisioned 